welcome back. Just getting ready, getting some reference images. And we're back. So I have an image here from Kim. She had a question about how to paint fur texture. I've asked her to restate the specific question, but as I remember, it was about how to deal with what is light, what is shadow, what are little halftone shapes, how to do it, how to make it look real. But Kim, please correct me <laughs> or specify so I know kind of which direction we are going here. I just increased the saturation a little bit on the reference photo and Kim said she's painting from life and not from the photo photo is not really representative of what she's seeing there. So I'm not going to be that concerned about color, more about the effect of, of the fur texture. So she says controlling values when dealing with deep texture. Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> improvise, riff. Feel free to uh, ask more specific questions as I go. And all of you, feel free to share your thoughts, your input, and your questions. I think the most important thing is to understand the volumes and to understand the light direction. If you're, and I assume the goal here is to make something that feels like you could touch it, like the painting feels convincing and alive, at least as alive as a stuffed teddy can look. Um, but yeah, that the goal is, is realism and, and volume. So conceptually, first step I would do in my mind, but it doesn't hurt to do it also on the canvas or in a little drawing study maybe, is to clarify some of these forms. So right now I'm grouping the shadows a bit more clearly and I'm gonna group the lights a bit more clearly. So I'm going the opposite direction. I'm removing the texture so that I can clearly understand the volumes. If this was an object that was not textured, it would be much more simple to understand how the forms are turning. And I guess for those of you that want to draw, you could draw the teddy. 
that's a good shape um, challenge. There's lots of stuff going on here. So, and I try not to zoom in and out too much, but I will zoom a bit. So in here, there's some complexity, right? That could throw me off. So I have to make a call. How do I want to simplify that? And I will say that the background is probably somewhere there. I'll paint this a bit lighter so I can separate what is Teddy and what is background. And I'll say this is a little shadow shape that's breaking into the lights. So I'm going to take it out and keep the lights unified. And then all of that is going to be shadow with maybe a bit of dark halftone before it. Same here, that's still light. I'm thinking of the terminator or the shadow line, which is going through here. And then back here, and then through here. A little bit of light on that back arm. So I'll also make that more visible. The rest of the arm is in shadow. Terminator. Maybe something like this. And I'll try to conceptualize each arm, like each limb as a cylinder and maybe the head as an egg shape and then the muzzle has another little egg shape or egg form rather like three-dimensional form that gray tone is dark half tones before we then turn into shadow and this means that the light is coming from top left And center light, like the lightest part. I'm going to change my color so it stands out a bit more. Maybe a blue. The lightest part of all these forms would be something like that. Right. From these parts, we get darkening, turning of the form. And when I'm going to add texture, I have to make sure that that big concept stays intact, that the big turning of the form is still working, even though I'm breaking up these big underlying forms with texture. So that was step one kind of analysis, understanding light direction, understanding each form, understanding how the values would transition on each of these forms. Now, with oil paint and with something like this, the style that you're after is really important. So I would be, I think I would take a, a painter you like and say, I'm going to paint this teddy in a style of that painter as much as I can. Because you can go, I pulled up some images here you can go uh, realism, like hyper realism, right? This is a drawing and every pore of the skin is drawn and you can do that. That's one approach. If you do that with this Teddy, it will look real. It will look believable. Um, if you like that style, go for it. It's time consuming, but not that difficult in a sense. It just takes time to stay with it and refine and correct and refine. If you're more interested in a painterly style, this is rep in here, then you have to work or you get to work with the abstract mark making of your brush strokes. And for me, that's more than half of what painting is and the joy of painting is to play with paint application. 
there's also Pietro Anigoni, who is something, he's a combination of those two. He's very precise in some parts, but then also very loose and calligraphic. There's a lot of design in his hair, the way he paints hair. It's specific and well-defined, but it's still loose and artistic and expressive and definitely not hyper-realism in the sense of copying every square inch or centimeter of the canvas with like a, looking through a looking glass and making everything super, super defined. Yeah, I personally like Anigoni, Repin, Velasquez, Sargent in some cases that a bit more free loose approach that from far away looks totally tightly rendered and believable but when you go up to the painting it all dissolves into this beautiful abstract explosion of brush strokes and that's a, a practice field how can you be loose and abstract but from far away create the effect that you're looking after I'm not sure, Kim, if that's what you want or if you're more interested in the hyper-realism, like really accurate control. You can let me know. If it's more something like this, where from afar it, it has a strong convincing effect, the trick to getting that, to me, is to step back from your work. Make the decision of what brushstroke to add next and walk up and make the brushstroke and then get distance again. That's how in the atelier schools we do all the cast drawings, still lifes, even the figure paintings. You step back, you assess, you decide, you walk up, you make the stroke and you walk back again because it has to look good from back here, not from up close. And then the magic happens. I'm a sergeant person, okay. <laughs> Let's see, I don't know if he has fur example specifically. Very abstract and paint like simplified, which Sargent is a master at simplification as well, organizing things, making sure things that are not supposed to be loud are quieted down. Like I assume this is a dog down here. Very, very, very simple minimalist well let's look for sergeant dog right that is shorter fur but you can definitely see the suggestions of fur happening but it's not hyper realism longer fur but the whole dog is much more simply painted than her face for example maybe the collar is another inspiration we could take for painting fur and it's not going to be that possible i think for me to do this digitally and emulate what oil paint would do but i'll give it a go the trick is to step away, step back and see if the effect is working. If not, add another brush stroke to make it closer to the effect you're looking for. Okay, let's try. Overall, I feel right now it's the shading is a bit flat, so I'll try to reestablish some form and I will do that at the same time as adding a bit of texture. I have a bunch of brushes. Some brushes will be a terrible choice for doing this, like a soft round kind of airbrush, right? If I paint with an airbrush, I am not creating texture. Although <laughs> this looked not too bad in the head, but it's more for modeling and shading and big clumps of texture, but not the individual clumps of, of hairs. Um, these kinds of brushes are looking more like charcoal 
so that's also not going to be good but maybe something like this this brush is very chaotic very unpredictable it twirls and these twirls might not be um, useful for fur but let's let's see maybe some strokes like this could work so I want to add a bit more light in it especially in the arm and maybe actually we can add a level adjustment first just to bring out the lights a bit more because the whole image itself is quite dark as well and I will turn on keyboard shortcuts so you guys can follow along or in the recording you can see what I'm doing okay so command L was the levels panel okay so I like these strokes I'll zoom in see it's totally messy I don't care what it looks like up close I care about what it looks like from back here And I'm not gonna fill in the whole area like this because that again flattens everything, gets rid of the texture. I'm trying to create texture that feels like the hair fur of the bear while I'm changing the value. I don't want this arm to start competing with the head too much, so I'll keep it there. I think the shadows are getting a bit light overall. Maybe that's partly sinking in, that this looks lighter than it actually was painted. And in the shadows, I generally want my texture to be more calm, more quiet. So I'm not gonna use this brush. I think here I'm gonna use this one, which is has a bit of texture, but it's um, softer, smoother overall. And I'll darken down and add a bit more chroma saturation. So I'm going right and down. So that these parts that are in shadow feel like they're in shadow and they're creating contrast with the form light area. And I'm, it looks very casual, but I'm quite thorough trying to leave or cover these light parts on the edges. It's pretty common for me at least to do something like this, or when I was starting, I was doing things like this often, leaving, yep, leaving these things. That will completely destroy what I'm trying to do or work against me. So I have to be thorough and cover these values that are too light for being in the shadow. Okay, it's already f starting to feel a bit more volumetric and believable. I'll go back to how it was before. I think, yeah, although the shadow part was standing out too much. So it's not a texture issue so far, more value issue overall, and probably was it was sinking in. Hey Kaya or JP, I'm not sure which is your first name. Thanks for joining. Also, everyone who's here, every week I am <laughs> questioning whether I should continue doing these live streams or whether I should focus on developing the shading course. Um, so let me know what what you think I guess it's hard for you to say <laughs> honestly like eh, I don't care that much about the streams I wouldn't mind if they go away but if that's how you feel please let me know for me this is mostly about practice to be in front of the camera and speak and a way to connect with artists from around the world. But 
yeah, sometimes I wonder if it's if it's better if I create videos that I have time to prepare and edit and just get to a higher quality than doing these pretty improvised rough uh, les lessons or sessions. This ear on the left, our left, feels quite flat right now, as if it was maybe something like this. That's how I, how my mind reads it at the moment. So I think we need to thicken it up a bit and make a shadow plane here. And we will get to more of the detailed texture, but first I have to make sure that the big things are working together. Because if I go in on the micro, while the macro is still a bit confusing, it will not, like none of the micro will, will really solve the problems. I would say this whole ear is also in shadow. It's getting some reflected light or ambient light. I think it's pretty bright up here. squinting we can throw the median filter on it and see how that looks noise median that helps to see more the the big effect of the image that's what i'm looking for when i'm squinting and yeah i'm not sure if this is a dark half tone or if it's shadow but catching some ambient light or reflected light from the top in cases like that when i'm not sure i will make a decision based on what's better for the composition so if i push that towards the light make it part of the light family does that help or does it become too chaotic too broken and i think probably becoming too broken so if I do the opposite and absorb it into the shadows make it slightly darker does that work better yeah I think it does I think that gives the head a bit more simplicity it makes it easier to understand to be understood so I'll do that I think overall the like composition and values are starting to feel better. I am going to get some more light on his belly. And I guess we're seeing more of the band, um, what's the word, the fabric that's tied around his neck, I think maybe across the belly which I like that's not so nice in the picture we just see a little bit of red here it's hard to understand what that is but in the painting and that's more clear the color might be jumping a bit much from this orange to this cold pink so maybe I can bring us some of that here to unify a bit more I 
Thank you, Bien. Okay, one thing that's super important or super helpful with fur is the contour. And Kim, you're doing that already. You're really taking advantage of that. So that means places like this, where it's a little bit up and down, but then wah, down, up, cutting in, out, in, out. If you have something like this, if you're able to create that with your brushes, with your brush strokes, that's really potent in communicating furness. I'm doing some um, masking. I guess this was a very complicated way of doing it. Um, easier would be to make the mask directly where you want to paint. So let's say I'm looking now for a place on the contour where there's more jaggedness on the photograph and less on the painting. So where we still have potential to show the fur on the contour of our little bear, maybe on the leg back here. So with the lasso selected, I'm making more or less random, but I'm looking at the reference, making shapes that suggest fur. And then with that selected, any brush will do. Sometimes it's nice to have a soft, like big airbrush a light value and if you want to work with the selection you can just paint into it i prefer to have the selection not visible but still active and in photoshop you can do that with command d sorry <laughs> command h command d just deselects and there's no more selection but if i do command h the selection is still there but i don't see the marching ants of the selection itself. So this is overkill, this is too much. I have to be a bit more subtle. Looking at the reference, it's mostly happening over here. And what I'm doing there contradicts the form a bit, like that's the shadow side. So um, I have more texture, but less form. There's always a balance. I think now I gave the texture too much importance and I've lost too much form. And those spikes are a little bit too big. So let's go back, undo, make another, take another pass and I'll darken down this area. We can work also from the background into the fur. So now if the first step was work like getting more fur into the background, but all of this is pretty soft at the moment, the way it's painted. Also down here. Sorry, this is an awkward way of showing it. I hope you can follow like where I'm scribbling. Those two places are very soft the way they're painted. And that's nice to have a variety, to have some sharp edges and some soft edges, but it looks too fuzzy right now. So we can sharpen the edge with the lasso as well and create the fur texture with the lasso. I made a selection of the background, command H to hide the selection, and then I can paint and sharpen things up kind of from the outside in. Oil painting. <laughs> You will wish sometimes that you can do this in oil. I haven't found a good way of, of masking really that works well. So what if in a situation like this, when I want to sharpen something up, a flat brush tends to work well. Uh, let's go here. Oops, not shopping. Right, something like that tends to get nice, sharp, clean edges. And also you can do fur, like furry lines, spikes like that pretty well. Uh, 
Okay, so now I'm scanning the whole image for places where I can do that same thing. And this area here on the arm jumps out. There's a little bit of light being caught in there. It might not work. It might be too awkward a position. <laughs> it's kind of like a armpit hair <laughs> in there, so it might not look good, but let's try. And I made a mistake, but I'll show you what that was in a second. I'll have to redo it, but let's add the light. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we might be able to get away with it, but the mistake I made is poor design. Right, so even though I'm doing these shapes quickly and roughly, I'm still conscious of the type of design I'm creating. And here, that's not good. That is one, two, three, all the same. And then this one is too similar as well. So go back and design a new shape. And the reference is usually helpful because it will give me organic variation. So there's a thicker clump with two spikes on the side. Then it's more quiet and then tiny spike, bigger spike, small, small. Or we can even make individual shapes just floating in the air and fill them or paint them. Right. That from up close looks ridiculous, but from afar it might feel right, look right. In this case it's very sharp and very digital looking, so I'll switch to the mixer brush and I have B for the brush and N for the mixer brush because they're right next to each other on the keyboard. So B will paint and N will mix. So I can blur some of these shapes and make them more painterly, more organic. What else? I'm looking also for places that confuse my brain. Um, maybe this eye a little bit. I think the shadow is going over a bit too much. So what if we do this? And the fur is so thick, so long here that I think the, the only way of painting this is just to try things out. Make a brushstroke, see if it works. If it doesn't work, cover it with another brushstroke, but keep stepping back, like keep zooming out, keep making decisions from far away based on whether the form is reading correctly and you're getting the sense of, of this type of fur that this bear is wearing. Right here I'm confused with the structure of the ear. It feels like one piece, another piece, and this going down somehow. But the whole thing is one form. So let's also group that together. And I'm laying down the brush strokes in a way that creates a bit of chaos, a bit of looseness. From far away it looks cool, from up close it looks messy, but that's fine, that's nice. These guys here probably will be confusing, so I'm not going to put it in. Whenever you have light and shadow, shadow is over here, and you have a light shape in the shadow, it can really confuse things. Sometimes it works, but use with caution, I would say. Oh, right, if this sphere was furry, we can do something like this. 
right? That's purely working on the contour. I haven't done any shading, any half tones, any shadows in the light. I've just broken the contour. It already reads like a furry sphere. Then we could break at the terminator, bringing shadow into the light and maybe bringing light into the shadow carefully. Maybe I should have done this from the start. It's some darker half tones. This was too gray. And if the fur is deeper, there'll be some actual shadows. And let's give this a proper shadow color and not just black. And let's check if I'm doing halfway to black. For those of you that are in the shading course, halfway to black would be around here. This is a dark picture, so let's adjust for less ambient light. Yeah, cool, pretty close. Maybe also lasso be helpful. Then in the shadow we'll have occlusion shadows and I'm totally making this up so don't expect too much. I'm just trying to get furriness and if that was sitting on some kind of floor then we'd get occlusion towards the bottom. Also here, darker half tones. Still light family, but getting darker. And then I would do something like this for actual occlusion shadows that are deeper. I like the soft brush for occlusion so I can slowly gently paint that in. Maybe go a bit lighter again. Not that light. Maybe the soft brush works to show some of the clumps turning. I'm not sure. Yeah, looks kind of furry. I think having no reference is not a smart idea. I should be I should be looking at the bear on the left a bit more. Yeah, from far away, it looks furry. Back to the bear. And let's see if there's any questions. Not so far. Simple, we're talking about painting fur. And this is an image from Kim, who's here in the audience. Kim, do you have any questions? Anything you'd like to uh, dive in more deeply? I think next for me will be to look at some of the more precise texture. So now kind of big forms are working. I will start zooming in a little bit and work more on the specific texture type that we have here.
So that will mean drawing or suggesting at least some of these smaller shapes where the curls are following a pattern. And in some of these places we have occlusion shadows and just form shadows. So maybe one key thing is also working at the right zoom level, which usually is further away than you might think. I could work at this zoom level, but then I will really be uh, tempted to draw individual strands of hair. And when I zoom out, I know it's going to look terrible because I've done that before. It doesn't work. I much prefer going from far away, making things work there, come a bit closer, make things work from there, come a bit closer and develop the image like that gradually. Some clumps going down this way. Always um, being aware of repeating things. Like these strokes are too repetitive for me. They're like one, two, three, four, five, all the same, all straight. It's probably not happening on the bear. So I'll cover them again just to break it up, make it more organic. Changing brush size is a good thing too. And some of the colors here are, are very gray. Like here, here, here. I'll probably cover those as much as I can to bring more life into the painting. Because gray color means less life, typically. And at the moment it's quite painterly, so we can, I can be quite rough and it still works. You can even push the saturation a bit extreme with some brush strokes to give more interest, more life. And whatever is form light, form light area, that part of the object that's getting direct light really try as hard as you can to avoid gray colors and very dark colors and you're doing that pretty well right now there are some spots here 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 that uh, feel too gray and too dark here on the bear, you'll see that even the dark parts, that areas that look dark, like maybe, uh, let's go this way, this area, or this, or this, that is pretty dark down here in the darkest, but these are up here, right? Kind of mid-tone and pretty saturated. So we want kind of strong, light, light, bright colors overall in the lights. I see some activity in the chat. Give me one second to take a look. I'm going to hunt down <laughs> these gray parts and give them a bit of color and then check out the chat. On the warm lighter side, would you stick with warm colors in the half tones, or would you use some cool colors in the deep shadows, form shadow? I wouldn't. Well, it's all a question of degree. Uh, yep, yeah, I just made some layer confusion. One second. Okay. 
So when you say cool, some people when they say cool, they mean okay, blues, like cool colors. In the way the painting is done at the moment, that would be totally too much, right? But we have some oranges here. This is a fairly warm orange, but we can decrease the saturation and paint an orange next to it. But now that's a very cold color by in, in comparison, in context. And the way it's painted right now is quite rough. So you have freedom of, of not having to be so controlled and so consistent and so tight it still works but the tighter we become the more colors that don't work will stand out like some of these darker grayer colors that i just covered were starting to bother me more than they had at the very beginning hey chum we're doing fur painting fur um there's a couple ways of like conceptually dealing with color and form and I still don't have a very good understanding of the one way that works best but what tends to work pretty well is to have like if this is my local color let's go a little bit more saturated that's my light <clears throat> then I go halfway to black for my shadow check the environment like we can paint that on the environment is very dark here not much ambient light so from halfway to black I go down more to take into account that there's not much ambient light and then in terms of temperature what I've seen is being the lightest value here having highest chroma and then the chroma dropping in the half tones. So that would be something like this, but the shadows staying a bit warmer. So more saturation and then less saturation and then more again in the shadows. If the material is shiny and there's a cold light source, you'd have a cool highlight. The cool specular reflection, but that's separate from the halftones turning. Some materials will be more chromatic at the dark half tones because light is going through them so i'll push that here as an example something like this where the chroma is high in the lightest half tones maybe low on the specular reflection but let's Let's get rid of the highlight because that's it's really confusing things easily. So highest chroma dropping, 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 and then here raising, rising again, more saturation. And then in the shadows, less than in the dark half tones. But yeah, I feel like I'm not the best person to talk about these kind of recipes for turning the form. I don't understand it so well yet. From the photo, I can't really get that much information with that. There's also local color change, which might be nice to include a little bit, like the muzzle feels grayer than the body. And I don't think that's just the light influence. I think it looks like that's actually physically the hair is grayer. I wouldn't do it as much as we, as we see in the photo, like on the whole head, because that makes the head feel less alive than the body. 
but let's see if we can bring some of that. You have it already, I guess. Some more white hairs, white whiskers. And if you look at the nose, it's surprisingly light on the left side, which we can also incorporate. You see those tiny brushstrokes I just made on the contour? They make quite a big difference, I think, when we zoom out. I'll go back before they are there. See, now this is a pretty smooth material. And if I put them in, it feels more furry. They're a bit too thin for the actual fur, but I like how it looks right now, so I'm going to keep it. We can always thicken them up later. But we do need speckle reflection on the nose. That will give a lot of volume and more realism to the nose. There it gets actually quite blue and cold. Might be able to do it just with gray. No. Okay, let's go. Touch of blue. Then a little bit of Fresnel effect. I see here on this side of the nose, there's some reflection. Right, same here. And the blue I was mentioning is right here. I cranked up the saturation of the photograph, so you may not see that on the real setup as strongly, but I think it's kind of nice. And we can add a little bit of shadow over here. That looks like fur covering the nose. I'm going to take it off and then highlight, probably also cooler. Yeah, not that big. And my mind is putting my attention to the clock. Let's see, we've probably gone an hour or so. No, maybe a bit less. So I think I'll do maybe 15 minutes more. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Happy to answer and jam. <laughs> Argy, RG, what blew your mind? Now I'm just letting my brain kind of look at the whole image and go to where places call out to me. Here, I think we were too light, so I'm adding a bit of darkness. I like this little shadow curl coming in. So I'll see if I can suggest that. It's probably a bit too high up there. Some of this stuff feels a bit gray, so I'm adding more color. Getting too repetitive in there. I need to break it up. I'm adding some of the smaller texture bits and I'm really scared as I do that because what I'm doing is introducing dark stuff in our light family and that usually is a recipe for destroying the volume so I'm doing it but I feel like danger danger so I'm gonna do a little bit and zoom out and see if it's having negative effects and yeah I think it's too much already 
like I'm creating these dark splotches that are not helping the form turn. So let's go back in with some lighter furry marks. All these colors are pretty gray, so I'm gonna bring up the saturation a bit. It's a jungle, like it's a total chaos in there. And that's bad because it can be really confusing, but it's also good because you can just play. And if it doesn't work, if it feels flat, like the form doesn't read, or you don't like the design, just paint over it. Like this is very bright for being so close to the edge right here. So probably better to cover it. But then if I want some brighter spots there, I can bring it back carefully. And you can do this all day long. You can just play and design and sculpt. And at some point I said I will give some thickness to this ear and I forgot. So <laughs> let's come back. Um, sometimes the background color or value really works against you. Sometimes it helps. Um, like maybe back here, we can try darkening a bit more. To show more difference between the body and the background. And let's get rid of this. And then let's see if we can darken over here to balance the composition out a bit. And yeah, it feels more I'm, st I'm starting to like it. We're getting a bit more volume and more textury, furry feel. What's jumping out at me now are these pearls, which all feel a bit too big and too clumpy. So we might just kind of paint in from the background and scale them down. I know that's easier done digitally than with oil, but you can do it with oil too. And Kim, I actually really like what you've done here with the paint application. It feels like you were not thinking about kind of painting by numbers of, okay, it's a circle, has a lighter part, has a darker part. You were just, I assume you were looking at where, where are things kind of lighter, where are they grouping together and making those decisions to just put paint there in a way that feels like what you're seeing in the reference or in your, in your model. And for me, that's good. That's, that's creating the the magic of painting and you're creating some really sharp edges like down here and some very soft edges and that play is beautiful I think that's adding richness and interest so as I'm scaling them down I don't want to lose too much of, of that beautiful variation. Maybe I can come back in with B and keep some of these edges soft. And I'm totally winging it. Now I'm not looking at the reference, which is not good. So in a moment, I'll zoom back out and try to get more of the effect. I feel like probably some of these colors are too gray, right, for shiny pearls. We are really over here on the no chroma zone and yeah that will make them look a bit dirty so there's a different shape here i kind of like the shape on the reference this feels like it's going against the floor and what's happening that's nice on the reference is that if these are the pearls we are getting darkening as you're approaching the bear in the reference, so something like that. See, they're bright here and then dark over there. I think we need that. That's some occlusion created by the bear itself. 
so just darkening here they're all also more silver color at least over here not on the left they're looking really yellow over there is am i <laughs> do you guys as you're watching feel rushed listening to me because i notice i am trying to get as much done as i can um in the time that's left but i wonder if i'm stressing you out and kind of making it unpleasant to listen which is not my intention okay things are getting a bit too blurry but I like the color direction. It's feeling more warm. We're getting more form by some of these pearls here dropping into shadow. So there, and then I think I'll make the final things. I'll work on these pearls a little bit because they have some of those dark gray marks on them which make them look less pearly, less real. And sometimes it's really just hunting down these parts that are gray colors that are too dark and too gray and integrating them and that makes a huge difference. So let's see. You can even do it from up close although better practice to step back when doing this and I'll push the saturation a bit on some of them like really going high chroma maybe up here they will also drop into shadow so I'll darken them keep the chroma Kaya or JP, I assume Kaya is your first name. Is that a question about what is causing the halftones to be less saturated than the shadows? Or is that a statement? Sharp edge, very dark. I will add a little bit of glow. Get rid of the very dark part around the pearls. That also tends to help. Yeah, question. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. See, also places like this where we have very dark tone right up against the pearl. I do it blue. This that tends to destroy the illusion of something being shiny and bright. And the quickest solution, at least in digital, is to do something like this, like paint a bloom glow effect, which will, I'm way overdoing it now, but that will lighten up where, we, where it was super dark before. So let's do the same thing, but more subtly. Same here, this dark tone, this dark tone, they're too close to our pearls to be so dark. I'll go before and after in a second so you can see the difference okay i think this will have to do before 
and after and those final touches before and after look at the pearls especially on the bottom and on the top or on the left and the right they need more work than what i've gotten to now but these it's maybe just 10 places where we have colors that are too dark and too gray up close right up against the pearls just cleaning out those those areas make the pearls look more shiny more pearly nice compositional touch is over here where the pearls are in the contour oops messed up the last one oops let's see if we can bring that into the painting as well and then i will answer kaya's question or attempt to at least that's feeling a bit too green i'm going to go back to orange can work from the outside in just bring in the background a little bit yeah Let's see i think that could work and now we have bump 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 that communicates pearl form okay so what is the reason or what's the causing the half tones to be less saturated than the shadows well, let's start over oops <laughs> wrong layer here local color halfway to black adjust down because there's less or little ambient light in this scene we would get to something like that as a starting point one way of looking at this and what's happening in the half tones is if we bring in a darker tone is that in the light half tones we have more light energy light is hitting from upper left it's hitting the surface here at a right angle so a lot of light energy somewhere over here it's hitting at a more shallow angle so it's a bit less light energy somewhere over here it's at a really shallow angle so even less and less light energy can translate into less saturation so that we would have the most saturation up here and then dropping off just darker value equaling less saturation i don't really know if that's always the case i think it depends on the material but it tends to work well for shading and then translucent materials will have an increase in chroma not value but chroma saturation we could use the sponge tool here which has a setting to saturate and I can yep okay it's driving the value up too hmm. well let's do it like that just as a like to really call out this area of the dark half tones a translucent material can have a increase in saturation there and then also actually in the shadows because light is going through the material into the shadow right you're asking that so then the shadows would be super desaturated in a translucent material no the shadows also gain some saturation so in a translucent material i'm not sure but maybe the least saturated area would be somewhere 
in the lightish middle half tones. I'm not sure. Let's look for jello or wax or and I'm going to look for a photograph and not a 3D render and a photograph where we have direct light but also subsurface scattering see this is all shadow we're not seeing any light yeah I guess it's a limitation of photography too like we see some light here but it's all overexposed because we're exposing for the shadow Hmm. <laughs> right, this hand here looks obviously CG, obviously digital. It's looking a little bit dead because it doesn't have subsurface scattering. With subsurface scattering, these thin skinny areas would get a increase of saturation. Kind of like what's happening here. like this and on matte surfaces if we go back here shadow the shadow value depends a lot on what is around the object if it's a totally dark environment we will get a black or almost black shadow if there's a red floor for example here then that red will bounce up and mix with the orange sam nielsen is really good at explaining this stuff also how the different colors mix he has a excellent class on schoolism whoops Like what happens if this is a blue ball and it's mixing with red? All these things I don't have that much practice with. Also, um, Bucci, Andrea Bucci. I might not be Andrea. Do you guys know who I mean? Might not be Bucci either. <laughs> Marco Bucci, okay. He has some really good videos on YouTube about color and color interactions that are more clear than what I can give right now. Recommend it. Yes, Marco. Kim, does this help? Not the last part so much, but paint over. This was the start and then some um, adjustments with the big values and then some more detailed refinements. If I had more time, I would just keep going the way I've done on the head. Step one, step two, now we we'll just keep going in closer and refining more and more. Okay, guys, let's leave it here. I hope this has been helpful. And <laughs> we've done two live streams today. Um, yeah. So I'll see you next week, I think. While I, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'll see you next week. I wish you happy drawing. Have a good week and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.